Fellow Winchester residents, and welcome to our next round of candidate forums sponsored by Future Winchester. My name is Steve Boxansky, and I'm your host for tonight's discussion. I'd like to take this opportunity to first thank Future Winchester for putting this forum together and giving me this fun opportunity. I'd like to thank the people who helped develop the format and context of tonight's discussion with all the questions. And of course, we want to thank the WinCam team for all their cooperation, assistance, and patience as we embark on this new endeavor. They really are the last bastion of local news, and we are very grateful to have this opportunity. Let me talk a little bit about Future Winchester for a minute. Future Winchester is a nonpartisan, not for profit organization that was established to promote awareness in Winchester's town government and encourage greater civic engagement. Future Winchester does not support or oppose any candidates for elected office, but is focused on the issues and the decisions being made that will impact our town now and in the future. For more information, please visit Future Winchester's website at www.futurewinchester.com. In keeping with this mission, we believe that more forums, more public participation, and open dialogue are to the benefit of our residents. We're not trying to compete with other groups that hold similar forums, but hope to complement these existing and valued traditions. Simply, Future Winchester sees this as an opportunity to exercise our First Amendment rights under the U.S. Constitution and to inform our friends and neighbors about what is happening in our town and the community. We hope to bring a unique perspective and perhaps grab the attention of some residents who have typically shied away from local politics or other forums. Tonight, we have the pleasure and honor of speaking with one of the three candidates for the select board, John Dobbins. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you, Steve. We really appreciate your participating in this live format, which we think is the best way to conduct this, uh, this business. Interacting live, it gives you a good chance to talk about yourself, your candidacy, and it gives the residents a really good chance to get to know you. While we may not have all the candidates here, it's important to let everyone know that all were invited to participate. Uh, as we have done with other forums, I'm just going to go over some of the ground rules and explain some of this, sure. uh, and, and so you and our viewers know what to expect. And first, at this time, I'd like to also stress that this forum is a vehicle for greater awareness, engagement, and education. And we want this to be informative, fun, and stress-free. So I encourage you to be yourself, be candid, and let's have a nice conversation. Thanks. To begin, we're going to give you one minute to introduce yourself to the community. What's your background? What's your personal story? How long have you lived in Winchester? What brought you here? All that good stuff. And then we'll move on to more of the platform and the position statements. We'll give you th around three minutes for your perspective on the role of school committee. And you'll have a chance to explain your priorities. And tell us why you're running and why residents should vote for you. From there, we'll run through as many questions as we have time for. So without further delay, let's start. John. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, well, um, I want to say hello to uh, you and uh, thanks for doing this. And thanks to uh, Future Winchester. Thanks to WinCam. This is I hadn't. I, I must confess, I haven't been in this studio before, and uh, this is like what it feels like to be like. Um, I don't know, like a news anchor, I guess, right? <laughs> so, a little bit. I don't know, except I'm not in jeans like they are. <laughs> so I, I really played the role. But uh, no, this is exciting, and, and thanks for doing this. I wish we had other participation, but um, everybody's going to make their decisions. That, that's OK. You know, um, we just we did a debate last night. So folks, um, for people that don't know me or maybe didn't catch what was going on, I, I feel like I'm repeating, but I'm not. I just don't want to explain. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Winchester High Schools. So, uh, my children are graduates. Uh, the Winchester Public Schools, I should say public schools for me too. And uh, we still have one, and it's a shout out to the Winchester Red and Black who are playing uh, Catholic Memorial tonight over in Woburn right now. That's exciting for the hockey team, and I know we have the girls' hockey team is coming up, and then also the boys' basketball and everybody, you know, so it's an exciting time of year because it's the playoffs. I digress a little bit. However, so uh, a little bit about myself, you know, as an adult anyway, I've been a, I've been a coach in the, in the, in the town. I've uh, coached both, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the boys' sports but, uh, but, and also girls' sports. I consider myself a mentor. One, I'm in, still in touch with a lot of these folks, and that's, that's fun. I did have um, 
a chance to, one of the gents in the neighborhood, I'm, I'm a pilot myself, and he, he looked me up through somehow through social media and said, uh, I'm a pilot, you're a pilot, thought you should know. So me and my, my good friend Nick, <laughs> he took me up flying this summer, and that, kind of, that got me into, I'm a commercial um, aviator, and he, he took me up flying in, his, uh, in wow. his own plane down in uh, Cape Cod, and that was exciting. So I want to give a shout out to Nick Ressler tonight, and I did get permission to use his name. So <laughs> Nick, you're safe. All right. So, um, you know, my, uh, as far as uh, some of the things in my background, my wife and I, we've um, been involved with a charity with a lot of our good friends and hard workers in Winchester. That charity is the Bridget Brigade. It's been tough sledding with the uh, pandemic as far as doing fundraisers and things, as you can imagine. Uh, it's still active, you know. Um, I'm going to put a little plug in it because we do get applications, and it's a charity that helps um, families that are struggling financially with uh, critically ill children. So we've been able to hope, uh, hope over 30 um, plus families was also helped out in filling the gaps at the Winchester Hospital for a lot of equipment, some of the other, the Franciscan hospitals, you know, the smaller area hospitals that have a need. We tend to focus on the pediatric ward because uh, that's, that's just, that, that's the, kind of the, the nature of what, what we're doing. And um, anyway, check us out. But that's, that's I've also coming from, a, you know, where I'm coming from, I'm, I'm a 20 year Naval officer. I went to the US Naval Academy. So I've been wearing, I wore the country's uniform for 25 years. I served as a federal civilian for 12 years over at Hanscom. Uh, not always by choice, but the airline industry has had its ups and downs. And, uh, you know, we can talk offline more about that. But um, I've also, but what, I consider myself a problem solver, a team player, someone who likes to build consensus. Um, I'm not running as an activist. Um, I'm running as really a helper. And uh, I feel like I've, I've got a lifetime of skills and experience. I'm from the town. I've seen a lot of the changes. And uh, I just want to, I, really, I just want to, you know, try to put, keep the ball moving forward, as we say. In, incrementally, everybody does their part. And that's, uh, that's sort of the, the spirit I got from um, our mission statement at the Naval Academy is to serve, and uh, here we are. So um, I've got an MBA from Babson. I've been a program manager. Well, I'll talk about that experience as we talk through the different mm -hmm. um, uh, problems or, or issues that are facing the school committee and the schools in general, and then the town in general, if you want. But um, I'm also I'm a union member as American Airlines pilot. So I, I have that, I, you know, I, I, have, I feel like I've got that experience of being on the other side, of, too. So if you're a teacher out there and you're part of a union, you think, like, oh, OK, well, here's somebody. I'm, I'm part of a union myself. So I'm running as the Fresh Eyes candidate, the open years. I, I consider myself a good listener. Um, if I'm not, I think I have a, I have a good cadre of friends and helpers that let me know when I'm not being in the, <laughs> and that's, that's important too, right? So uh, last night I used this and um, I was thinking about it, but we, um, when I heard from the parents that he thinks he's famous now, I'm going to use it again, but uh, this, this came up when I first pulled the papers and got the signatures, and that was uh, from my, my friend Bilal Paricha, I'm friends with the parents, and they said, Bilal wants to know what's in it for him. And I, you know, I thought, you know, that's about right. You know, when um, Bilal's in the eighth grade, what's in it for, you know, what, what's in it for him? And uh, tonight, we'll, we'll get to that, the answer if uh, I did it last night, but I'll, I'll do it tonight again. Thank Great. you. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, obviously, you've got some deep roots here in the community, uh, and you're quite active. So glad you're here and part of this great town that we have here. Thank you. Um, so let's go on to the next step sure. uh, and feel free to take the next few minutes to explain sort of uh, give us an opening statement uh, what makes you qualified to be a member of the school committee why should people vote for John Dobbins yeah well I, I covered the you know the background and um, I put up a prop here I don't know if, uh, if it's showing up for the wind cam but uh, this this flyer my uh, daughter Maggie she's 21 so she put this together I thought she did a nice job it's got the red white and blue and that gets people's attention, I think, you know. And then we've got some things in here. You know, why, 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 why do we want to do this? And uh, I think keep the focus on the kids. You know, we've been through a, a rough stretch here with two years of a pandemic. There's a lot of things swirling around. Um, you know, it's, we, we've, we've entered a phase in the country where I think that um, these shocks to the systems tend to exacerbate things that are going on. They could be financial, they could be war. But in the pandemic's case, whatever was going on in the greater community, it gets a magnifying glass, maybe accelerates some things. And when I say to keep the focus on the kids, so here I'm running for school committee. This isn't Supreme Court. So I'm the focus on the kids, this is the lens I'm looking at when I look at problems or issues that are coming up in the school committee. Now, are, are the kids coming first? So you know, this is philo philosophically what I'm looking at. The second one, I keep politics out of the schools. 
I, you know, this, this was a bit of a surprise to me that this has become such a hot button thing, but man, oh man, I want to get the anti-bullying policy and put it on Facebook. But uh, no, we'll, I'll, I'll leave that. All right, so let, let, <laughs> let's dive into that a little bit okay. more and explain that. Explain uh, yeah. what, what you mean by that. So well, I would just say, you know, when I think about, like, keep politics out of the school, what's, I think the corollary is what, put, them, put politics into the schools? And then whose politics are we putting into the schools? So these are questions I'm just thinking philosophically because when I look at, at the politics out of the school, this really stemmed from, um, I've sent two emails over 20 years to the Winchester Public Schools. You know, I feel like that's probably fair given the tax. Maybe I'd even get like an answer or, you know. And I didn't just send, when I say I sent two emails, it was basically about two issues. And one was my son, you know, I'd heard about this uh, when the girls were in school. They'd say, oh, you know, the teachers are talking about the politics or this or that. And I'd say, well, what courses? You know, if it was a social studies or history, I could, you know, okay, well, you know, and if this is a club after school, you know, people should, there's definitely, but when we start talking about like calculus or chemistry or something like that, whose politics are we talking about? And, and is that really what the focus is? And now if we pull it back and it's hybrid learning, where you have two days in school during the pandemic, one day of cleaning, two days off, and we're in some of the, you know, that time was precious. Mm -hmm. So um, not that, you know, just, hey, everybody needs a nudge back in the lane. I understand that. This is where I'm coming from. But when I send this off to administrators and things, and it's like, it, it's a complete um, blow off. And then when I maybe get an answer after I roll it up to the higher levels, uh, and it comes back not framed, and it's like, oh, did it touch a chord? So anyway. That's where, that's where I'm coming from. I just think whose politics we want in schools. I don't want my politics in schools. I don't want your politics in schools. And um, if somebody has ideas about what politics they want in schools, you know, then I bring it back. Well, is this foc are we focusing on the kids then? So that, that's sort of philosophically, why, why am I running? Celebrate the institutions and the traditions of the United States. You know, where I'm coming from, the 25 years in uniform, going to a service academy, a retired vet, um, I just think that uh, in a town where I grew up and the pizza boxes came, they all had um, the Heisman Trophy winner on uh, the great Joe Bellino who went to the U.S. Naval Academy. You know, so these are like sort of the heroes that the family, uh, Joe himself, I, I, I had met um, through my father, but the family was uh, all around town mm -hmm. and uh, they sort of anchored the lines on the football teams and, you know, during the great days. But anyway, um, not just uh, Joe, as great as he was, and uh, he's passed on now, but uh, Glenn Doherty, who was another, um, I didn't know Glenn, um, you know, knowing about him now and learning about him, I mean, this is somebody who's protecting our foreign service officers over, overseas. So that's, a, that's, you know, that's close to the heart when I, you know, one, I know what, to become a Navy SEAL, which Glenn was, that in and of itself is just, you know, an, quite an accomplishment. And then to actually die in the line of duty, whether he's wearing the uniform or not, he was protecting our people. You know, I mean, that's something that should be acknowledged. Then, quite frankly, we have the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is Mark Milley. He grew up in this town. Not everyone knows that. Interesting not every, fact. Well, you. you know, and, and wouldn't it be great if Bilal and his friends could could maybe get a Zoom call from one of these one of these gents or their family members or hear hear about it. I'm not saying every day, but when Veterans Day comes up, it's a day off. It's a day off, and I'm down in American Airlines training, thinking it's a day off. Wait a minute, what's next week? That's Veterans Day. So I just shot off an email, and uh, to the what are we doing to commemorate Veterans Day? Same thing happened. Nothing. Nothing. And you know, I know people are busy, whatever else, but. Uh, it, it's time for, it's time, you know, this is where I'm coming from. These are the things I'd like to just make sure I foot stomp. Not for me. I mean, there's other people out there that have done, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just, you know, these are the things that I think were a positive impact, and there's others. And once you start these balls rolling, you, you find out more, oh, this one had a, oh, this one has a cousin. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if we packed a care package one day? Mm -hmm. That's just one. There's others, too. I mean, I asked uh, my son, what are we doing for President's Day? His answer, when's President's Day? Well, that was two days before, you know, the President's Day weekend. So um, celebrate the traditions of the United States. Again, I think that, that that's something that pulls us all together, doesn't divide us. And uh, that's something, I, you know, why would I get involved? 
because of the own personal experience, I think that we, we've got some good things that um, not just a community, but as a country, we can be proud of. Um, I've written about it in sort of my opening campaign stuff that you can read on Facebook and, uh, you know, uh, whether it's the freedom of speech, separation of church and state, all these things can be celebrated. Now, that isn't to say that we don't have our, um, the parts of our history that are, are troublesome or that there aren't injustices that still exist today and those should be covered, but, uh, I, you know, let's, let's talk about it all. You know, the, 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 there should be some balance there. All right, and then, then we sort of, you know, why else are I running? Well, I'm looking down on the, um, use the leadership skills to build a strategic roadmap. I worked on large uh, Air Force programs for the Navy, uh, for the Air Force um, as a civilian. In the Navy, we're all as officers trained as sort of project officers because that's what we got to do, whether we're um, setting up overseas or uh, in my case, you know, we didn't just fly the airplanes around or helicopters, I flew them both. Uh, we had missions, so we had equipment, we either did minesweeping missions, we took, uh, we picked things up externally, we dropped them off on ships, we did it at night, sometimes we had to re refuel. So this stuff what didn't just, you know, we didn't just take off and say, okay, what do you want to do now? I mean, this stuff was planned out really down to minutes and seconds because, uh, uh, and unfortunately, mistakes are made, and we learn from them, and there can be loss of life and limb. So, uh, you know, it's, the, the lessons learned are often written tragically. So because of that, that type of skill I could bring to the larger programs as a problem solver and a team builder, um, because when you get into the larger programs, you have an incredible amount of stakeholders. There's a lot of money and there's a lot, you know, it's not just, it's congressional, you have uh, corporations and you have unions, and then you have the needs of the Air Force, and sometimes those get overruled by the congressional. So then, you know, what are we gonna do with the money? We didn't even ask for it. Well, they told us we're gonna put it on. Well, uh, so there's, there's a lot to that. So I understand, I think, bureaucratically, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm new to the business at the town level, uh, but that's exciting too, because what that allows me to do is get to talk to people. So um, as I'm prepping for this, I get to talk to um, administrators, I've talked to principals, I've had tours of Lynch, I've talked to teachers, not just one, not just two, I won't say how many, but I've been talking to them and I'm not, I'm not stopped, I'm reaching out to community leaders, had a great call today with our state rep, and uh, you know, these are good people trying to help out. We probably wouldn't agree on everything else. I don't even know if they like the same football teams I like, but that doesn't matter. We, you know, we can have, we can, you know, we're all, we're all working towards the same goal, which we want to move the ball forward. If I think Winchester has excellent schools, let's keep them that way. And then how are we going to do it? And uh, so anyway, well, the, the one thing about that is I think the transparency comes with having a strategy, having a roadmap, defining what the requirements are right now and for the future, and then prioritizing those requirements so that as the ground rules and assumptions change, whether it's things like inflation or requirements because, uh, you know, you had a fire, I don't know. You know, we, we don't have crystal balls, but we have to have some plan that we're working off of, and then we can adjust. So I think the old adage is um, plans don't matter, planning is everything. So, and there's a lot of committees and, and there's a lot of stakeholders here. I'm not, this isn't a one, I'm not running to be the, um, you know, the dictator of the schools <laughs> here. I'm gonna be one of five and I wanna I want help. But um, I think, uh, you know, um, like I said, we, we can work together and just my put would be let's, let's build that strategy and I can help with that. And Great. then, you know, and then, uh, and that, that falls into help plan for the future. That might be a long answer, but uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> no, there's a lot there, and obviously there's a lot of passion uh, that you have, John. So that that's always a good thing. Energy, passion helps drive things forward. Uh, they're complicated, as you said, lots of different stakeholders. So when you're thinking about a school committee, you've got parents, you've got teachers, right. you've got administrators, right. you've right. got budget constraints, you've got all these things. And it is a puzzle, and you need to work with all those different voices to try to build that consensus and, and come out with a plan that works. Um, so thank you for that detailed answer, John. Sure. Very good. Um, obviously, again, you care a great deal about this, and you've prepared well. Uh, let's start to dive into the role of school committee. Okay. Um, and let me talk just a little bit about the school committee. It's The school committee consists of five members. Each one serves a term of three years with staggered election dates. So they're not all up for re-election at the same time. This year there are two spots open uh, and there are three candidates, two incumbents and yourself, uh, Mr. Dobbins. Um, the mission of the Winchester School Committee is, quote, 
to provide all students with an outstanding education in a nurturing yet challenging environment that fosters academic achievement, healthy social and emotional development, enthusiasm for education, and a lifelong love of learning, end quote. Uh, they meet twice per month or more if necessary. Uh, and the meetings typically include the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, and the financial office who add to the discussion and answer questions but do not vote. Like the Board of Health, the school committee members found themselves in uncharted territory with the onset of the pandemic. And we know that it has been a challenge navigating their way through all the questions and policy decisions. And so I want to just give a thank you to the folks who are serving on the school committee right now for their time. It's also important to note as we get into the questions, we recognize that the school committee is not solely responsible for many of the topics that we're gonna to touch on. It takes cooperation with other facets of town government. However, it is helpful for the voters to hear your thoughts on the relevant topics, and that's why we're here tonight. Sure. Let's start off right away as we touched on the pandemic. It's still among us. Happy to say that we're, we're not wearing masks tonight at, the, at this event. Uh, the last one we had two weeks ago, we were under mask, but uh, good to see things are moving in the right direction with all the numbers going in the right direction. Uh, but there's been a flurry of activity at the state level, at the municipal level. We know the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has rolled back uh, their mask mandates for schools as of February 28th. Our school committee uh, has voted to transition to optional masking, but we don't yet have a defined end time and, and, and a drop date. What's your take on these developments? And do you believe this is the right approach? So uh, I think it was, um, so right now is March, was March 2nd, March 3rd. So mid-February, mid I was uh, setting up a, a meet and greet in the, um, this is some flurry act, uh, of activity. There was, a, there was a meeting up at the Parker School with the school committee and um, so the people that maybe were interested in the uh, meet and greet, or at least some portion of them, I don't, I don't know how many people would have come. It was, it was doing it down the library. They, they, were, they wanted to go to the mask meeting. This is what they were going to talk about because the, the governor had released, you know, lifted the, the mask mandate at least as of February 28th. And there was, a, like you said, a flurry of activity. So now this was open to the public. So uh, I went up and I spoke at that. And the crux, I won't go through it word by word. It's, I, I've posted it on my campaign. Um, Facebook page if, you, if you're really interested or you can go on to WinCam and look and watch the, um, that mid-February meeting. Uh, I don't have the specific date. But the crux of the matter is I look at this thing in the public health not being, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a doctor, but the way, um, the, way uh, the lens I look is risk. So what is the risks and so, um, and then who, who's, who accepts those risks? What is the risk to the community? What are the risks to the kids? And then uh, what are the metrics we're using? So this came up um, in a, in a last night in the debate, and for the two incumbents, my question was, um, so if we're not lifting, so right now the public schools still have masks, the greater community does not. Correct. Um, they really didn't, you know, it, you know so we're in this again, we're, we're, you know, in a lot of cases we're parents, and I know you're a parent, and, um, you know, we watch the Super Bowl and our leaders don't follow the policies if they have them. Um, you know, we get to see the different, you know, going back, you know, months, that this is, it's not onesie twosies. This is like, and it's both sides. It's not, this isn't like a, a, a political thing. But um, when we look at the risk and then we look at the metrics, so if we're not lifting it now, what metrics are we looking for? I mean, we could pull them up today on Massachusetts. I look at them from time to time. I've listened in on the, um, with the Board of Health and, what, and they're looking at a lot of the same information and you know they're good people trying to do the right thing. But in the end, we know there has been a huge impact on the children and if anybody doubts that, listen to those parents that spoke so passionately at that meeting. And um, I, I'm, I've got to say quite frankly, you know, maybe the message got through but I, I just, you know, I'm not used to, you know, I'm new, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the fresh eyes and open ears candidate. I want to go out and hug some of these people, you know, when I see how they're, how they're reacting, telling these stories. And you know when they tell a story, they're probably giving you know, about 10%, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it's, maybe it's not their kid or, you know, it's, you know this is sort of like, and yeah. anyway, so, you know, it's passionate and, and, and I understand this, you know, I don't want to discount um, the health impacts, but as we, you know, thankfully Omicron has, you know, it looks, uh, we, we know the numbers are low now. I mean, the, the, I, to my knowledge, the, the school buses now don't have to have masks because that That's was correct. federal. But the Winchester schools are still masked today. And 
So I think we just have to step back and kind of ask why, and if it's why are why are we masked, and what are we looking for? Because and then the other piece of that this is this is, doesn't end now. In about six months, we're going to have another wave. I don't know if it's this variant or hopefully it's you know it's just a, a milder variant and it's just some sore throats. So, but we don't know. So what are we planning for there? Plans mean nothing, but planning means everything. So the time's not to waste. This has had real impacts on people. And as we talk about budgets and other things and priorities, this type of thing, people say, oh, it's masks, it's this, it's that. Not necessarily, it's focus on the kids. Yeah, let, let's stay on that topic, focusing on the kids. For the past couple years, kids have had a tough time uh, they've had to deal with some pretty wild dynamics having to wear the mask staying isolated from friends and family missing out on lots of extracurricular activities like birthday parties clubs sports and of course school we, we had at least a half a school season at home um, and that was tough what are your plans going forward to help repair and support students mental health yeah that that's that's something um, uh, we had a daily times uh, I reached out to them, told them, you know, I was, what uh, the plans are running. They uh, they sent a list of questions. There was an article published, and um, I posted that onto the uh, the town residence site. Gets gets you know it's a lot of traffic, and um, maybe I'll p post my whole answers because I gave detailed answers and they edited it down. But you know, I thought, well, that that's a nice job, and you know that I understand that the Daily Times isn't the Dobbins Times. You know, they don't have to <laughs> publish my whole bio. You know, I could keep going, but I think what was it? Uh, Mark Twain said is like, sorry about the long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one, so I wrote the long version. They they published a slightly shorter one, but it had the gist of the stuff. But people people see things through their own lens. So anyway, going forward, um, you know, with the mental health, uh, that was the that was something listening to the parents at these meetings talking to people once people would hear about this you know my phone i, I talked to people i give me a call i listen to the stories and uh you can't not think you know i'm friends with somebody you don't have to click around too uh, too long on facebook to find out who um that's really uh knowledgeable about the community and especially the young people and this isn't something that just happened during the pandemic. But like I said before, the pandemic seems to, you know, and these other shocks magnify the issues. And the, certainly the pandemic, in this case, was a huge magnifying glass. And something uh, I learned talking to the teachers is we, you know, you get to, get to know folks and they start saying that the, the teachers are, they've got mental health issues. So they're trying to keep kids separated. You know, the, the kids are acting out their masks for seven or eight hours. And wow, the stress. And uh, maybe the administrators are too. I, I, you know, I haven't heard that yet. But I mean, they obviously they've got a tough job, and I want to thank for them. You know, they're they're doing their level best. And so um, I know it's a priority. You know, it gets. But now, like, okay, well, we've identified the problem. Okay, now how can we help? Again, as a leader, you pull together the. We need all the stakeholders, the, the people that the experts on this, sure, but also who are the people that are impacted? The students, the children, the teachers, and how and, and is this helping? And you know, and then when it comes back again, if if we get get back on course and we fall off, how do we get back and yeah, you know, th this is a constant process of continual attention to it. But we know about it. It's, it's an elephant in the room. Um, I'll have something in my closing statement about it. But uh, something from talking to the, the folks in the community and then hearing from the teachers that this is a huge deal. And um, yeah, this is, it's, 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 it's something I think. It's, it's, I call it the all hands on deck moment. That's a Navy term. But you know, this is general quarters. And uh, there's real impacts. I mean, I think you, know, you don't have to talk too long to anybody. anybody from any background, mm -hmm. their greater families, sometimes their short, smaller families, have been impacted in some way by with mental health and, and, and the things that can lead, that can lead to. I'll just leave there. Thank you, John. Uh, and staying on this sort of broad topic, during this time, many parents 
uh, were and remain frustrated with a lack of access to teachers and administrators in the school committee at different times. Uh, we've seen a lot more engagement since the onset of the pandemic, and sometimes that's due to just the Zoom nature of some of these meetings. More people, it makes it a little bit easier to access. Um, what lessons have you learned from this experience, and how can we bring teachers, parents, and administrators together to work on these issues? Uh, the, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, this came up a little bit last night, and this has also been an observation. Uh, I've been watching some of the school committee um, meetings, and um, you know, certainly the masks are like an impediment to communications. Uh, I have, I've met with other, you know, not school committee members that are up for re-election, but um, I'll just say I've, I've met, you know, in in in. Uh, well, I'll just leave it there. I don't, I don't want to get. That person in trouble. If, if, if they can be in trouble, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't think it would be, but who knows. So I'll just say in the discussions, you know, it's like, what is the communication role? What's going on? Because it's it's not clear from somebody sitting in. I mean, when you go to the um, the public hearing for like the budget, and the budget is like almost sixty-one million dollars, and you're the only one sitting. I'm saying me, not like I'm. I'm just saying as the observer. So if if I woke up from a coma. And I stumbled into this, and I said, what's going on today? Oh, we're talking about two-thirds of the town budget right now, and this is the um, open public hearing. Uh, and I'm the only person here? Okay, it's a pandemic. Are other people calling it? What's going on? So, and if that's the, and now, okay, so if just, you know, from my background, and we, we've talked about that as a problem solver, well, how can we improve on this? Shouldn't we have a little more, two-thirds of the town budget, since more people be involved in this, or, or at least... So, uh, so how do we facilitate that? One is, and again, I don't want to be too critical. This, the, the, the work in, this isn't a paid position. It's a volunteer position. Um, my, uh, I don't call them competitors. I'm not really running against anybody. I'm not running as an activist. I'm running as a helper. But they are the incumbents. And I, when, I, when I look at it, I mean, I would tell them, having the meeting up at Parkhurst is the, right there, you're sort of in a backwater. I mean, I live up, up near there, so it's not for me, but then where do you park? There's no signs, where's the school committee meeting? You know, maybe when you get inside the door. So I've been there where like, oh, they couldn't zoom in, then you sort of hear it, a, you know, a door slam and a huff and a puff, and somebody comes in, okay, is this the right place? And, but, oh, no, the public part was the 10 minutes, and we had, the, you didn't sign in, and I'm like, okay. So just in general, looking at sort of the modus operandi of what's happening, at least on the public side, let's open this up. If we can get back to some normal, this is an, we're, this are unpaid positions. We can have a free dialogue here. And then if we can be more transparent about what's going on, all that stuff I talked about of here are the priorities. Mm -hmm. We're coming out of a pandemic. OK, well, how are we going to get ready for the next phase of this? And what's happened in the pandemic? Who fell behind? And what kind of help do they need? All right, well, we have these, these type of mental health issues, these type of people that maybe have special needs, or these people that now have other problems that are, that are just because of the, you know, people uh, are always going to react differently to these things. So then how, how are we focused on that? And trust me, I'm not coming with all the answers. I'm coming here to learn and then help as a facilitator and somebody who's... But I think uh, you, you yeah. make a good point that maybe a little more uh, proactive engagement from the school committee. Is that what I'm hearing a little yeah, bit? I mean, I, or a way to bring the parents more into the discussion? Right. It's sort of like if you have a birthday party and nobody shows up and you do that three times in a row, <laughs> then you know maybe you're not getting the word out. I don't know. Like You need to like, maybe think about how we're doing this. I mean, I'm being facetious yeah. there, but if you get the point, like, if um, if no one's coming to the meetings and no one's in, maybe you know, maybe I just completely missed this. But um, as far as I, I think we, I think it would be better if we had. I think there'd be less angst in the in the community, quite frankly, if people were more more uh, plugged yeah, in on I, what's I, I happening here, especially when we're doing things with the, you know, the masks highlight it, right? But there's other stuff that's going on and. More communication, more, more communication. inclusion makes everyone feel better about yeah, the process so maybe no matter let's, what let's it get is. The, let's get the meetings down to the town hall maybe. We can use that auditorium or maybe down to the library if not that many people. Now people can still zoom in. Let's, get, let's work that. But um, let's open it up so that we get more participation. And if we're, and if we're not getting the participation, let's let's start. Why aren't we? Yeah. Do people feel like they just don't, like the, their voices aren't being heard or I don't know. Let's... Uh, this, this is something to work on, for sure. All on. right. Thank you, John. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, let's talk about the facilities and uh, 
and the school committee's right. role in planning and prioritizing what have become very expensive endeavors. These school yes. projects are not cheap. For example, we have a couple big commitments on the near horizon. Uh, we've got the Lynch School and the Morocco School right after that. These are likely to require overrides. Um, what are your thoughts on the town's capital needs and plans for the future when it comes to our schools? And does the school committee have a role there and what should that be? Uh, yes, they do. So there's this uh, EFPBC, but that's basically, you know, that's that's the entity in town that's working the school committee right now, you know, and uh, Mr. Nixon's, you know, he's, he's heavily involved in it, and he, you know, he's put a lot of work in it, so, you know, he has my respect um, doing And th there's some good people. I had a tour. Great people are working on this, and they've been, this is the same team in a lot of respects that have worked on, um, those of us, you know, like uh, my kids went to Ambrose, you know, so they were fortunate to get that, you know, you know so Vincent Owen's been done. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know this, so there's a model to it. We have this, um, the state, the MSBA, but that's really, the, you know, the building authority that they do contribute. So they have, there's, there's some stakeholder roles there. You have to play by the rules if you want to get there, 30 or 40 percent. And um, so, yeah, the school committee has a role. And, uh, uh, but the other thing is, again, you know, like the communication of what we're doing and because anytime you do a school and the, you know, I, I, I don't want to like just hit on the obvious, but you know, the school now doesn't work the way. So we, you know, we have the swing space issues. Now we're looking at house parkers. This feeds into, so if we're doing lunch, where do the students go? You know, what facilities do we have in town? Again, there's different, you know, I, I, my background of the program manager, we want options. Okay, so if this works out, that we could do it this way. Maybe, we, you know, can we, can we um, dovetail two of these uh, projects at the same time? Okay, what does that do to the swing space? You know, the modular piece. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so there are impacts. You know, there's trade-offs to do this. Um, if we're doing all green, what does that do? So, I mean, I, I, in a perfect world, you do everything, right? You just have a, you just have a um, checklist and you check them all. But now when we look at, like, cost, schedule, performance, and then what are the risks to it? So, okay, so if we go one way on this, and then what are the, do we still have to do the backup? And uh, so there's, a, there's so I, I would consider part of, at least for me, part of that communication, the leadership, and then um, we know we have to do, I mean, Lynch, and that, that's, that, that's moving out. We know there's going to be an override for that. Would it be great to get to a place in town where we didn't have to do overrides? I think yes. Um, is that doable? I'm not sure. Uh, but um, I think we're going to have a lot more confidence and trust from the public if they know what the plan is. I saw there was a master plan in 2017. It's, it's detailed. Um, the cost estimates obviously have to be updated. Things like inflation, which are now, that's real. Like, what does that do? It maybe pushes projects one way or the other. You know, you know what I mean? So like, it isn't like what we're cutting, what we're not, what we're not gonna do. It's more, what can we do, given as we all work within our own budgets at home, um, and our greater families, you know, so. Uh, yeah, and that, that leads right into my next question. Oh, so we're, we're okay. right on the same page here, John. Uh, uh, he hasn't picked his school yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, but the Winchester school budget has increased on average 4.5% each year between 2011 and 2012. Obviously, there's many factors beyond the, beyond the control of the school committee. Yeah. And let's face it, quality costs money, right? Okay. Um, but what is the school committee's role when it comes to budgeting and spending? Yeah, so as I can see, I was, I was following around the... Um, the budget process, so it looks like in the fall, you know, the superintendent puts together with the, with the, in this case, his team, Dr. Hackett's team, and uh, they work, you know, and then he comes through, the school committee gets the review. There's a, there's a lot of things that are, are built in costs on this budget, so, you know, the, like you say, there's things that are out of, out of their hands as far as the operating. And then, you know, whether we're adding in the curriculum things, and there, there's some other things. I would, I would um, my put on that, Given everything we've talked about, and we heard at the debates last night, everybody's saying the number one priority is mental health. Well, let's, what are we doing in the budget? So, you know, talking about things is one thing, but then we have to put the resources behind it, even if it's a wedge, right? So um, I come from a world where we had management reserve. So management reserve said, you know, it's kind of like if, you, if, I mean, if you're doing over your basement, you don't just say, oh, the contractor said it was this. I mean, <laughs> you know, the contract, right. But once you get going, the things happen, right? Because yep. so... Uh, and the same thing in the budget, so there's, there's going to be some unknowns there, and, uh, you know, so there's some flexibility, but we know we want to do mental health, 
Um, my my look at the budget now, and I, I you know, if I'm if I'm uh, you know so fortunate enough to. Uh, be trusted with a position on the school committee um, my, to learn to work with um, the, the there's people that are a lot smarter on this working on the budgets ever you know the, the other the other members what are the, but then knowing if we can what are our priorities are we resourcing them and then what funding's available I mentioned I was talking with um, Representative Day today and we went over the thing I have, I have a pretty good understanding of uh, where we get our funding you know 80 percent of them for the school comes, comes from town. 20% um, or so from the from the federal government. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I should say the state does 20%, uh, and then the town funds 80%. Those are rough numbers because the federal government comes with about 5%. They do have some things for special needs. If you hit certain thresholds, you you get the, the circuit breaker they call it. And then, but then we have we do have some money, and I've talked to the town leadership. Um, they call it ARPA money, but for WinCam and for our purposes, it's COVID relief money, right? But mm -hmm. we can, it, it's 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 pretty it's it's a wide bucket, and we can use it. And when so we're talking about mental health for the students, mental health for the teachers. This is like you know 6.8 million was the, was the number I I heard. Um, we don't maybe don't have to use all of that. Maybe we can use some of that f for other things. But uh, let's that that would be one thing that we prioritize. And uh, if you get the buy-in, if we're all talking about it, and, and then we have the transparency, people see that, okay, when that comes up in the budget, well, that's, here's, our, here's what our strategy is. This is our roadmap. This can be funded. You know, inflation is going to take a bite out of this. Um, we'll see where that goes. You know, things will, things will change. I'll stop yeah. there. All right. Thank you, John. Um, let's talk a little bit. This is one of my favorite topics and favorite questions of the candidates because it gets into organizational behavior. Um, and it gets into what I call the blocking and tackling of making government work. So it's not mm -hmm. just uh, issuing a press release, it's really getting down and doing right. the work. Uh, and sometimes it's working with people with whom you disagree. So um, tell me a little bit about your style working with others, working in a team environment, and how do you overcome those objections? How do you build and find compromise? Right, so that, that's, in, in, so as I found out, working as, especially at the, at the uh, with the federal government, I mean, I was lucky enough, you know, I considered it lucky enough. A lot of people probably wouldn't want to do it, but, you know, I, I've been able to, like, present in, uh, at the Pentagon, you know, and um, with, like, undersecretaries. I don't want to say it was like I wasn't up at the, the, the highest levels, but uh, you'd be surprised. Those are pretty high stakes. And, the, and again, you don't just walk in with your brief. You know, like, maybe 100 people have talked about it, and they've looked at every word as almost as closely as they do at the Winchester residence page. But um, every word sort of scrubbed in this backup slide. So if somebody picks up on them, what, what, what do you mean by that? What is that word? Oh, you better, you know, you have to be ready. So there's a lot of practice, a lot of preparation. So we, uh, you know, again, hats off to the people on the committee that work on these budgets. They're doing this volunteer and for the town, the, the folks at the town and, and everyone that, that has a hand in it. This isn't easy work and not everybody is happy. But communicating is a huge part of leadership and transparency, um, knowing that uh, there's there's um, there's always going to be winners and losers when you talk about like the budgets and the you know because not everything can get done at the same time just just like uh, everything we just talked about. But as I see, um, you don't want to have surprises if that makes sense. So people, um, whether it's town, so the stakeholders, as I see them in the town, you know, you have, obviously you have the parents that are demanding. The, the students deserve the best schools they can, that we can give them. The parents demand it, and that's understandable. That's what, I think that's where we're coming from, right? And then, now, what are the budgets? Um, as a school committee member, I would be an advocate for the schools. But I, you know, I wouldn't lose the big picture of I'm also part of the town too. So you know, we don't want to make it so. Oh, we have the best schools, and we have nobody can live here after they retire. You know, like so there's going to be some trade-offs. So we have to stay, um, you know, incrementally pushing the ball forward. That would be my philosophy. And if people understand that, like, okay, there's some you build trust. That's where. Oh, okay. Well, what was that wedge put in? Well, they had this issue with. And now maybe there's another issue. We want to have that. You know, this is where the wedge is. Okay, what, that we're that we're looking for. Oh, okay, they did a good job with that. Maybe they don't. They're not following every detail. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't following every detail along the way. But as things come up, we we get to trust our leaders if they build trust with transparency. Great. Thank Let you. Let me squeeze one more last, last one final question. Should I in. check the score? Let me get one final question in, and then we're going to okay. let you make your closing statement, and then we're going to wrap up and get ready for our next forum. Um, 
I'd like to talk a little bit about the state of our politics. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like we've lost the ability to disagree without being disagreeable. The civility and decorum at the national level seems to be at an all-time low. Uh, and this trend is spreading to state houses and to municipal government. Uh, it seems like compromise, which was a good word when I grew up and learned about politics and leaders and compromise was the way you got things done. But now it seems like that's looked at as a dirty word. It's a sign of weakness and not strength. Um, and we could go on all night about the reasons why maybe we find ourselves in this predicament, but let's talk about how we get out of it. What are your thoughts on how we bring people together and uh, talk about some of these difficult challenges in a way that's not disagreeable? Sure, I uh, had a great conversation with a, a community leader today who's a first generation American and uh, we talked for about 30 or 40 minutes. I hope, I hope we become friends. Um, it was on the phone today, but it was, uh, uh, it was really, it was an interesting conversation because everybody has a story to tell. And uh, if we're all the same, wouldn't that be a, a terrible world, right? You know, like, would it, would it be really fun to be, like, if, if, you know, everybody just said, oh, yeah, you know, we, we just did, you know, the, the, the crossword puzzle just had the same answer on every line. That really wouldn't be. So, you know, there's, there's ways to look at this. I'm an optimistic person. I was 25 years in uniform. I got to um, work, travel all over the world and work with people all over the country and all over the world. And, you know, when you have dinner, you sit down you, and you meet with people, you find out you have a lot more in common with people than you think. Um, and especially now we bring it back to a town like this, it doesn't matter what you look like or what you, we, we surely, you know, um, all have a story to tell and we should celebrate that. Um, that's not discounting that uh, that, that does, isn't always the case and we have to always be on guard for uh, people that um, either f for whatever reason um, have some nefarious uh, or, or if it just is behaviorally, you know, there's just going to, there's always, and in every segment, in every population, we have to be on the lookout and not, not tolerate any type of uh, prejudice or anything like that. But, um, you know, we talk about politics and really, it, we're supposed to be striving for the st same goal. And like I said before, you know, I really didn't do this like I was running for the Supreme Court. And I know you don't run for the Supreme Court, you get nominated. But the, the point is, is that the, the stakes here, they are high in that there is some influence on our most precious co commodity, which is the future, which is the, chi the children of the town. And it's other people's children. So these, these, um, the decisions and the policies that are made do impact people, some more than others. I mean, the masks, that's one piece of it. And, uh, but there's another side to it. People are concerned about health. And we have to be open-minded about that, too. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, we ha there's a balancing act, but I think if people um, could maybe take in, a, there was there's something going around with, I think it was, um, there's a uh, Morgan Freeman quote that's going around, you know, I think if, if people would just, you don't have to hate somebody just because you disagree with them. Exactly. You know, and um, I certainly, I mean, I'm from a family of 10, and uh, I'm the ninth, and um, I still try to sometimes get treated like, like, um, <laughs> no, and I, we won't go there, but I'll just say like, yeah, let's, we, we let's, don't disagree on everything. Yeah. And I would just say like, you know, for me personally, if I can be, as we all can be, if we can be leaders and representatives out in the community, show that we're good faith actors, we're um, respectful to people, and, and, that, and that goes, uh, how do we behave in public? How do we behave on Facebook? You know, really, what, what type of example are we setting? Really, like you know, we're yeah. having a good conversation here. The gent, I, I won't, I won't dime him out today. We, I didn't get his uh, permission, but um, my new friend out in the community has a, as you know, great perspective. We probably don't agree on everything. We didn't get there, and, and that doesn't matter. I wouldn't expect we would, you know. And uh, maybe he'll change my mind. Maybe I'll change his mind on some things, and that's okay. And maybe he won't. All right, you great, know? great answer. Great to keep that open mind on that. Let's give you a couple minutes to close out, make your closing statement. And then we're going to wrap things up and we'll get ready for our next forum. Take it away, John. All right. Thank you again, Steve and uh, WinCam and Winchester voters and uh, future Winchester. And uh, we, we did cover a lot. And um, I took uh, five chocolate espresso um, <laughs> beans before I took this home. <laughs> I'm probably going to hear about this because I know I was I was I was a rambling man here tonight. But I'm excited because the the teams are, are playing and uh, you know what what what's better? We've all been through a lot. Yeah, yeah. So um, without belaboring the point, I do. I'll be serious for um, a minute. Uh, 
It's been great. Just in the last few weeks, I haven't been at this for, two, for a year or something. It's really been going on for just maybe like six weeks. But uh, meeting again uh, people in town government that I didn't know, getting to know some of the leaders, you know, PTA members, teachers, administrators, every, it just all, all the, the community leaders, hearing their perspectives. I didn't know about the teachers' mental health. You know, it's easy to focus on things. The priority, though, I do think, um, when I hear, and, and, and I know, you know, and it's, it, it's hard to talk about the elephants in the room, but when you hear that 38 young people have died in the Winchester community in the last 10 years from other than natural causes, man, and that's not just Winchester, that, you know, we look around, I'm sure the numbers, but that hits, that hits home. I mean, I think we're, we're all, we all know, um, we're all been touched for that, and it's not just you know that's ten years of this. So as you said, you know here we have we have this, you know the politics are tough. That's and then like how are the kids reacting? That what type of environment um, are they in? And uh, so looking back at that, how can we help? Because this is really something um, I think we can we can help at the schools. I said there's 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 a, the piece right there with the. Um, with some of the COVID relief money, you know, it doesn't have to be high dollars, and you know, or at least in my mind, it's not high dollars. But you know, maybe whatever it takes, we've got to change, change that, that dynamic, because that is just uh, that's something you know we we can't stand as as we all get older, knowing that the next generation is going to be taken over here, that, that it just can't stand, and. Um, I just want to just say, uh, I hope uh, on March 19th, the, the voting's at the high school. So that's important. I know it's a Saturday. So, you know, I didn't always think about what, what are they holding signs for? What are they doing? And, um, you know, the, this is, like you say, future Winchester. And these are, these are important times, you know, given the gravity of the situation there. Um, go out and vote. I hope you vote for me. I hope you earn the vote. I hope you enjoy it. At least you, maybe you watch some of this, maybe told you to turn it on. And, and, um, and then I do want to bring up, because uh, well, I got the feedback that um, Bilal understands that he's now famous because he was on <laughs> WinCam last night. So I do have to answer Bilal's question again, because you know we don't want it to be a 15 minutes of fame. We want this to continue. So Bilal, who asked that important question, and it made me think, you know, what's in it for him? And, um, you know, I like think when I, I think when I was in eighth grade, I probably wanted a lot of the same things he wanted, but maybe, you know, like uh, more candy and, you know, more days off and this <laughs> and that. And, you know, like, what are we really looking at? But I really think the, the best thing we can do for our, for, the, for, him, for him and all his friends and all his, um, um, all his colleagues, as we say, as, as fellow students, is give them the education, you know, I was lucky enough to get that uh, my children have been able to get. Get I've, I've had an in, uh, everywhere I've been. I've been able to be successful, whether it's you know in high stakes uh, flying in the military, at Annapolis, um, those briefings, getting ready for them at, at the Pentagon, or going over to places like NATO, or being in the Middle East and talking to to folks. And and I really, um, whether you're. Uh, I really feel like it was because of the foundational skills I got um, in the Winchester Public Schools, and that's what is in it for you, Bilal. All right. And I'll close with that. that. that, that that's a great way to finish off. Uh, I want to thank you, John Dobbins, for your time tonight, candidate for school committee. Uh, it's been a fun experience. Uh, I want to thank Future Winchester again for putting this forum together. I want to thank uh, the teams of people who helped put our content and questions together. And once again, thanks the wonderful team here at WinCam who made this happen. Uh, thank you to the residents of Winchester and make sure you get out and vote on March 19th at Winchester High School. Thanks and stick around. We'll be back shortly with our select board candidates. Good night.
Good evening, friends and neighbors and Winchester residents, and welcome to the next round of candidate forums sponsored by Future Winchester. My name is Steve Boxansky, and I'm your host for tonight's discussion. I would like to start by taking the opportunity to thank Future Winchester for putting this together and providing this fun opportunity for me. To the people who helped develop the format and content of tonight's discussion, and the WinCam team for all their cooperation, assistance, and patience as we embark on this new endeavor. They really are the last bastion of local news, and we very much appreciate this opportunity. Let me talk a minute about Future Winchester. Future Winchester is a nonpartisan, not for profit organization that was established to promote awareness in Winchester's town government and encourage greater civic engagement. Future Winchester does not support or oppose any candidates for elected office, but is focused on the issues and decisions being made that will impact our town now and in the future. For more information, please visit their website at www.futurewinchester.com. In keeping with their mission, we believe that more forums, more public participation, and more open dialogue are to the benefit of our residents. We're not trying to compete with other groups that hold similar forums, but hope to complement these existing and valued traditions. Simply, Future Winchester sees this as an opportunity to exercise our First Amendment rights under the U.S. Constitution and to inform our friends and neighbors about what is happening in town and in the community. We hope to bring a unique perspective and perhaps grab the attention of some residents who have typically shied away from local politics or other forums. And while we may not have all the candidates with us tonight, it's important to note that all candidates were invited to participate. Tonight, we have the pleasure and honor of speaking with three of the four candidates for the select board, John Fallon, Jim Johnson, and Vincent Dixon. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. For the edification of our viewers, just want to let everyone know there are two spots available for the select board, as one of the members resigned before the term expired and one member's term is up. Select board members serve a term of three years. The select board, select board serves as the town's chief executive body. They cause the laws and orders for the government of the town to be enforced and shall cause a record of all of its official acts to be kept. Generally, they have overall responsibility for the operation of town government and need to sort out the various positions of different departments and boards to keep the operations running. They also provide leadership and direction for our community. As we have done with other forums, I'd like to explain to the candidates and our viewers what to expect tonight. First, I'd like to stress that this forum is a vehicle for greater awareness, engagement, and education, and we want this to be informative, fun, and stress-free. We are not looking to catch our candidates in a gotcha moment or to pigeonhole anybody, uh, but we see this as an opportunity for you to share a little bit about yourselves, why you want to be elected to the select board. So I encourage our guests to be themselves, be candid, and let's have a fun conversation. To begin, each candidate will have one minute to introduce themselves to the community, talk about their background and their personal story, and then they'll get a three minutes to explain their perspective on the role of the select board explain their priorities for the long and short term, and really tell us all why you're running for the select board. From there, we'll run through as many questions as we have time for, and you'll have each have two minutes for each response. So let's get started. We're gonna start with introductions, and we've selected John to go first. Great. Take it away, John. Great. Steve, thanks for moderating. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Future Winchester, for hosting this. One camp for their work, and for residents who are watching tonight. Um, I'm John Fallon. I've grown up in, uh, I was born in Winchester, grown up in Winchester, I'm a part of the Winchester school systems. Um, my wife Kathy also uh, went through the Winchester school system. Uh, and it was great. We have uh, seven children. They're all products of the Winchester school system. Six of them are UMass grads, and our youngest daughter, Jacqueline, is a sophomore. So, May 2024, <laughs> we're going to have seven <laughs> UMass grads. Go Minutemen. Um, I have a uh, BS in uh, marine engineering, um, a third engineer's license to sail any ship on the ocean, and um, I have an MBA in finance. Uh, I'm, 
a, ser a serial volunteer, if you will, uh, over the years. I've uh, been the president of the Winchester uh, Swim and Tennis Club for six years, on the board for 12. Uh, I've coached like almost every parent has in town, various sports, you know, through so uh, the Winchester Soccer Club. I've uh, been on the FinCom. I'm currently on the Board of Assessors and uh, was a Cub Scout leader because no one else wanted it, <laughs> but I like Cub Scouts. So that's, that's really uh, a little bit about my ties to Winchester and a little bit why I invested in so forth. Thank you, John. That's a great answer. You're a busy guy. All right, Jim, let's move over to you next. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting us. And I'd like to thank WinCam for performing this service. It's a great public service, and we need more of them. Uh, my name is James A. Johnson, commonly referred to as Jim. And I want to be one of your newly elected select board persons. Um, and with your vote tonight, or not tonight, on September 19th, Saturday, at the Winchester High School, I will be. I am a product of the Winchester Public School System. I'm a product of Winchester. I attended Winchester Public Schools, uh, the Washington Elementary School, the McCall High School, and the Winchester High School. When I graduated Winchester High School, I started a little part-time business to help me get through college. Well, 49 years later, I am still in the oil business, and I am still in Winchester. Um, I met my, my wife, Barbara, who is a Winchester girl, and we decided to raise our three children in Winchester. You know, Winchester has been very good to us, and we plan on staying in Winchester forever. And I do mean forever because we recently purchased a plot at Wildwood Cemetery. <laughs> now, one of the questions you asked was what brought me to Winchester. The very simple answer is my parents. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a great answer. And Vince, let's move over to you. Please introduce yourself. My name is Vincent Lawrence, uh, Vince Dixon. Most people call me Vince. Uh, when I was growing up, when somebody said Vincent, I knew I was in trouble, but you can call me Vincent. Uh, Not in trouble here. <laughs> I am uh, an historian. I grew up in the Alston neighborhood of Boston, uh, where my parents homeschooled me from kindergarten through high school. Uh, my father already understood that public schooling, uh, though it has many good spots in Boston, uh, was having some problems already. Uh, I then attended Harvard University Extension School, uh, cum laude uh, graduate, uh, earned a Master of Education degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Through these various educational steps, I've learned a lot about not just the things I learned, but the process of education, the role of education, the importance of different kinds of education. And that's an important area, though we're not running for school committee. This town is well known for schools. It needs to be as good or stronger with those issues. My coursework at Harvard included extensive study under the then dean of Boston historians, Thomas H. O'Connor. Uh, his books are still available. Uh, a wonderful uh, narrative historian who just passed away several years ago. Uh, and I studied under international economist and development uh, economist, Dr. Carol Holbeck, who was connected to the United Nations and was an interesting fellow because he knew how Germany had found its way to the free market after World War II and years of having been in a state system. Um, I worked in strategic planning and consulting. I lived in Cambridge for over 30 years. Uh, I met my partner, Emily Ann, at Memorial Church at Harvard, and I wound up here because uh, uh, she lived here and <laughs> I was uh, no, knowledgeable of the community. And uh, this is a quaint and energetic town, but uh, balancing that is very important. And for over 20 years, I've run a historic guided touring business in Cambridge, which sadly, with recent events, has been uh, largely put on the shelf. Uh, but an opportunity to meet people from throughout the world, including uh, former Lady Prime Minister of Canada and other interesting people. So uh, I have a quite varied background, and uh, Winchester fits that very nicely. Uh, but I think uh, I can bring some leadership skills to that and uh, part of understanding solving our problems is to understand uh, our history and how it's developed <coughs> and both our successes and our failures. That's another great answer. We have a room full of uh, interesting and very well qualified candidates here so thank you all gentlemen. Let's move on to the the next portion and this is 
gives you a chance to tell the the residents of Winchester what makes you qualified and why should people vote for you. Uh, let's start, let's go right back to you, Vince, and start right back over here in this left side of me. Well, good. Um, I actually, uh, as we go through these various issues, recognized uh, that there are, um, I think we're at about three or four different organizations, all of whom asked significantly different questions, so I took some time uh, to put down some notes, so I will reference them as well as interacting in a broader way. This town election, of course, uh, on a Saturday, March 19th from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the Winchester High School. And for those who've been in Boston or Cambridge, there's free parking immediately adjacent to the high school. <laughs> Uh, while I have a skepticism of your newer organization, I will extend a level of respect to your questions and topics because we must find a way back to a view of one Winchester, sharing a sense of unity and diversity, twin values that strengthen our open society. My appeal to the voters and residents of Winchester is to recognize the needs for a sustained, comprehensive and detailed approach to our problem solving and operating in the town of Winchester. I may be the only candidate or one of the few uh, to appear at and respond to all of the questionnaires and programs uh, because this is important that I am not driven by ideological faction but by rather philosophical values. Should I win this town election, I will have the honor of taking the oath or affirmation of office to the select board, which is on behalf of all of the people of Winchester, not just those who vote for me. This is something that not, uh, is not always understood these days. And that we need to follow the rule of law a little more closely, the constitutions, the statutes, the regulations, and the various guidelines. Uh, we've had some problems with that in this town in recent years. Ultimately, the rule of law balances the needs and views of majorities and minorities. That's why we are ultimately a democratic republic, majorities having a voice and minorities having protections. And we need to restore a dynamic of consensus in an open society. Beyond Winchester, we have to have a similar view even if we have significant and important differences. We in Massachusetts have as our legal title the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and there's a real meaning from the earliest European settler days. Uh, there was a sense of a broad social contract, a sense of value. Uh, and e even in those religious days where religion was central, individuals, individuals were encouraged to start business to show the glory of God uh, so that there'd be more resources for themselves, their families, and the broader society, a common wealth. Uh, and that's important because it means that uh, it was a hybridization of market, of capitalism, of religion, of belief and community. In coming days, weeks, months and even years, I will engage in sound advocacy and hope to inspire through ideals and ideas to move Winchester into an improved place in this, our Winchester, in the 21st century. And thank you. Well done, Vince. Let's move on to Jim. Jim, what makes you qualified and why should people vote for you as a member of the select board? What makes me qualified? Well, I have the local knowledge of the town of Winchester and town of Winchester town government. I have served on many boards and on many levels. The highlight of my service is I've previously served on the select board. I've served at town meeting for years. I started in town meeting when my children were in elementary school, just like many parents have got involved in municipal art school government. It's when their kids went to school. I have served on the Finance Committee. I was Chairman of the Veterans Honor Roll, which is a project we're all very proud of. Um, I have been the found, I am the founding member, one of the founding members of the EFPBC. Uh, for almost 25 years, I have worked on the Flooding Drainage um, Committee and addressed and successfully addressed the floodage and drainage issues in our community. Um, I've worked on the Open Space and Recreation Committee, both as an organizer and writer of the plan. Plus, I've also worked on the fields with my fellow citizens many years ago, but I did it. Mm -hmm. um, I've served on the Housing Partnership Board. I have um, been on the Wildwood Cemetery Committee. I've been very fortunate to become the 37th Citizen of the Year of Winchester. Uh, that is a very nice 
an honorable award um, by the town and chamber of commons like Jim, I've been very active in youth sports in my day. Um, I've been active in school issues. I am a local businessman. I'm a lifelong resident. I'm actually a product of the Winchester Public Schools and a product of the town of Winchester. And that is why I want to be one of your selectmen. I know, I know the town. I, I am qualified. I have the experience, the knowledge. I am very hardworking. You know, and I'm very respectable, everybody. I work collaboratively. I use common sense. I care about Winchester. And I listen. And then I ask questions. And think what is best for our town. I have in the past, and I will in the future, gets results that will make Winchester a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you for your extended commitment to the town and for your answer, Jim. Uh, John, let's move on to you. Your turn to let everyone know why they should vote for you for the select board. Sure. I'll uh, tell you where my brain's at, and they can decide if uh, I'm the person for them. Um, you know, which is a great place to grow up, and it's a great place to go, grow old. You know, I've accomplished the first half, and I'm working on the second, and, you know, hopefully I get there and can join Jim. And wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly a, uh, I'm a, I'm, I'm a person who is a glass, glass half full. Yeah, I, I look at life as an opportunity. Um, and part of the reason why I'm running is just uh, the, uh, you know, the polarization of politics has gotten in the way of us accomplishing things that I know that we can collectively. And like Jim, I'm a, I'm a consensus builder. I am asked questions um, and, and, and try to understand what, uh, what those issues are. Um, so. You know, when I look at Winchester, we've got uh, a number of challenges ahead of us, like we do every year. It's whether it's maintaining our public schools or our, our roads or it's uh, affordable housing. You know, there's a litany, a litany of issues. So I have my experience. I'm, I'm not steeped in government experience. Yes, I've been on FinCom and um, the assessor's office and so forth. But what I, I do have is um, I have managed a... Um, a group of uh, 130 people with a $30 million P&L, so I understand all of the personnel issues that go, go on with that. I have uh, the first 12 years of my career, I was the uh, work for uh, real estate developers and um, f uh, financiers developing uh, housing, affordable housing, and, uh, and commercial. So, and then for the last 25 years, I've been a um, commercial insurance broker, and I insure or, or I provide risk management advice to the largest uh, authorities and cities uh, in Massachusetts. So that gave me a different perspective. I've got the inside from work, working in the town, but I have the outside um, understanding the risk management aspects, both financial and non-financial, of uh, in cities. So it, it, when you roll those together, I, I, um, you know, for a value equation, I think I have a value equation that people will find uh, votable. Is that a word? <laughs> it is tonight. All right. <laughs> Good answer, John. Thank you for that. Uh, let, let's move on a little. Let's dive into really some of the questions that we have prepared. Uh, and we're going to start with Jim this time. Jim, first, please describe what you think the core functions are for town government and what is the select board's role? Well, actually, I don't have to define the core gov responsibilities and duties of town government. It's lined out in the town charter, which is a very important document. I would suggest, and I'll say this several times, that you get the charter, read it, and study it. The town charter is a very important uh, document for the town, and it sets forth many duties and responsibility of everything. Uh, actually, on page seven, it um, defines the office of the select board. It's uh, stated that the select board shall consist of five members elected to three-year terms, so arranged equally. It defines the duties and responsibilities where the executive powers of the town, and we shall be vested with the board of selectmen. Or, well, let me take that, select board. I've got to change that. Um, we have all the powers and the duties given to the board um, by the Commonwealth of Mass., additional powers and duties as authorized by the Charter and by bylaws and by town meeting. 
the select board shall cause the laws and order for the government of the town and enforce such. We shall cause to keep records, which are official acts, to, and we are to aid other boards in its duties and responsibilities. The select board shall appoint town council, town manager, and town controller. The appointing authority is with the Board of Selectmen for these three positions. Uh, we also have the responsibility of doing licensing and for doing any other items as designated by the town, town meeting, laws and bylaws. Um, now in my language, um, the best way to describe it and a quick summary is we oversee three key appointments we oversee the entire town. We listen to our citizens and their concerns. We should be a leader. We want to make Winchester a better place to work and live. We want to make the proper things, such as appointments, management of key personnel, and move forward. And we also set short and long-term policies with other departments and town management. Our goal as a selectman, or my goal as a selectman, is basically to improve the quality of life of our citizens. Uh, I believe the selectmen have the obligation to constantly work hard towards this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Extra points for having the charter in physically in his hand over I here. I have it all the time. <laughs> uh, in fact, I had one that wore out. <laughs> all right, John, let's go back to you here. Uh, same question. Uh, Please describe what you think the core functions are for town government and what is the select board's role? Well, I think Jim did a real good job covering the select board role. I mean, it'd be redundant for me just to go through that because he read it. I've got it written down. So All right. I'm spend time. So really, I, I'm, uh, wasn't Mayor Medino Tommy Potholes, right? He was. Right? Or, that, or, or Mumbles. Right, or Mumbles, right. <laughs> and, but, the, but the point is, is that it's about having good roads good schools, uh, a safe community, good fields, so, so people can go out and do the things they like to do safely and freely. And really, as selectmen, that's what I want to help accomplish. Not that it's not, we can't do that now, it's just how do we continue it now and into the future and, and set that groundwork for future generations to enjoy uh, what Jim and I certainly have enjoyed in Winchester. So that's it. That's a, that's, a, that's a succinct and concise answer, and you hit all the right points. Thank you, John. Vince, let's turn over to you now. Uh, and same thing, I guess what we're asking for is what is your vision uh, for a member as, as a member of the select board? Certainly. By the way, in potholes, there was also a former senator from New York, Alphonse Tomato, who's called <laughs> Senator Potholes, uh, because he brought the money in to fill the potholes. And he also raised money in Massachusetts, even though he wasn't representing us in the U.S. Senate. I guess we had enough potholes for him to call in. Uh, the select board is, in fact, a committee executive in the place of a mayor. So what Jim says in terms of referencing the charter is uh, quite good. Uh, he should have graduated from Harvard Law School, and then he'd be running a big oil corporation. Uh, I'm very happy with life. my family and my business <laughs> and my town. <laughs> in effect, that executive committee should be actively involved in leading efforts to achieve consensus and cooperation not just among its five members, the own, only five members that are there, but across town government and the entire Winchester community. In achieving a one Winchester view, which I talk about, laws, ordinances, regulations, and other guidelines must be attended to and educated across town government and the entire community. Of course, this means that the many challenges to broad, universal community information must be addressed as well. And this communication aspect is one that's very fragile these days. This WinCam operation is an important part of that network. Uh, the newspapers are thinning in their coverage, social media is contradictory, and as a result of Article 31 in the Fall Town Meeting, there is a Communication Study Committee, CSC, 
and I look forward to their analysis, recommendations, and explorations of these challenges. I've actually suggested that some type of nonprofit be established to keep a objective and sufficient source of information across the town. Uh, for those who may know the Brattle Theater or the Coolidge Corner in, uh, in uh, Cambridge or Brookline, those theaters no longer successful wildly with big profits established foundations and have continued to function for decades and actually provided education and I think we could do that here. There also needs to be some Winchester information accuracy, a journalistic code that people could sign on to. Uh, some type of local media quality organization act should be developed as a model, likely a 501c3 nonprofit organization that would permit a long-term objective media entity for the town that would intersect with the newspapers, with cable TV, other social media platforms, and vigorously provide high quality, accurate coverage. We all know that as candidates and as involved people in the community, the media entities have deteriorated in quality, and so forums like this are especially valuable in that context. Thank you. Great. That's that's a some some quality answers there, and so I'm looking forward to hearing more of this. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about how local government works according to our charter and bylaws. Uh, all power of the town shall be vested in the representative town meeting where policy is made for the select board to implement and enforce. Of course, there are limitations by the state on what town meeting may or may not do, such as raising property taxes more than 2.5% annually or passing a bylaw that is inconsistent with the state laws or constitution. Could you please share your views on the relationship between town meeting and the select board? And let's start with John on this one. You know, um, I, I don't know if there's implication that there's that the um, uh, select board is not following what the town meeting ha has approved or not. I, it's been my experience, my observation that um, you know occasionally perhaps there's there could be a little mission creep, but for the most part boards, committees, and so forth do as, as, as is prescribed. So, uh, and not having any first-hand knowledge, otherwise, I'm just, I just can't speculate on that. So that's, that's my answer. All right, All thank right. you, John. Thank you, yeah. Uh, let's go back over to Vince on this one. Uh, Take it away, Vince. Please share your views on that relationship. Certainly, town meeting and the select board should have a relationship. Um, at times, it seems weak. Uh, the idea that we have different views but that we all share the same Winchester isn't always there. And in understanding the relationship between the town meeting, our legislative body, and the select board, our executive authority, we have to centrally recognize the need to provide comprehensive annual training for all elected officials and bodies in town and most all town employees. Laws change, regulations and ordinances are created, various circumstances happen, whether they are environmental, financial, societal, educational, or other. We live in a dynamic era of technological change. In our present, as a historian, relatively new postmodern era, all of these factors mean that decision makers and public employees have an affirmative need to stay current to be respected and to provide improvement resources. And that's something that I would require to be done more generally. Uh, every year there should be a uh, town-wide educational program. Uh, we should more effectively work with existing organizations such as Mass Municipal Association, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and other existing associations that have tremendous resources, that have at times consulted to the select board, uh, but actually have a lot more resources that they can use. And while each of the questions in this candidate forum are important, many are complex in a time of complex challenges. Who knew that the two largest known challenges of our current events the COVID-19 virus and the Russian war in Ukraine are significant international events that have direct effect on our daily lives and how we carry them out. And that's something that could be plugged into an annual update. Unfortunately, to solve the problems of Winchester and move forward, we have to recognize there are numerous stale issues that have not been fully engaged in salt. Meanwhile, newer issues continue to add to the challenges we all face. To achieve a unified and successful approach, we need to set clear annual objectives and goals. I think this is a view that Jim also has. And create a larger and longer 
municipal laundry list of items to be addressed, too often the town budget confines issues rather than looking at the details in the context of broader circumstances and trends. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Okay, let's move on. And we are now going to... Uh, Jim. Did you forget me? Jim, my apologies. Okay. You are number three here. Jim, <laughs> turn it over here. to you. <laughs> number two and number three. I'm still in your hearts, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Jim. Okay, uh, the core function of town government, whether it be town meeting, select board, or the entire government, is to serve the public good, uh, to provide good services to the public, provide public safety, police, fire, health, good public quality education, uh, a professional services that are well run, whether it's for the town offices or the school department, um, a public works that works, uh, that provide good roads, good sidewalks, clean ground, um, a respectful cemetery, a transfer station, a well-maintained reservoir system, water and sewer, a treatment plant. We want to treat our employees fair and respectful. We want to treat our citizens with fairness and respect also. A uh, good quality town is in its people. Um, it addresses the capital needs of the community, short and long term. It's the people that is the government. And by having a volunteer base like we do, it makes it work better. Um, the role of the select board is to implement services. That's a very quick summary. We are to oversee government, take public comment, and work with the town manager to address issues that are broken and plan for the future. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad you reminded me that you needed to answer that one. That was a great answer. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the role of Finance Committee. Uh, this is one of the most important yet least recognized roles in town government. Mm -hmm. John's got some experience there. Uh, tell us your thoughts on their role, and do you see yourself more in agreement or disagreement with their typical recommendations? Vince, we'll start with you. Uh, I'll be your in-house counsel on this issue. Uh, <laughs> I previously served four years on the Finance Committee, 2015 to 2019. During my first approximately 18 months, I was surprised that achieving a quorum of members was sometimes difficult and that many members seemed to be in the dark about many aspects of finance, including what a bond prospectus is actually. This document is usually developed annually to provide the due diligence information needed to provide information to financial markets. Often, it has some of the most complete information about municipal government and financial circumstances, and for everyone, this is normally available sometime during the summer from the office of the town treasurer. I also learned that the town was a member of Mass Municipal Association and that there were various individual programs in the annual meeting that is a valuable trade show for municipal officials. While some top paid town officials regularly attend these meetings, relatively few members of town government more broadly appear to attend, and this is a gap in circulating useful information for carrying out the tasks of town government. Eventually, a modest training program was developed for the Finance Committee at my urging and the agreement of several other members, which proved to be valuable and could have been more extensive if there had been sufficient time. It's also occurred to me that the Finance Committee could provide a valuable service to town meeting and professional town administration by having an annual town financial overview for all elected and professional staff of government. I'm talking about before the decisions are being made. And every 10 years, the town charter rules and regulations are meant to be reviewed, and this fact should be engaged actively by suitable publicity and thoughtful analysis as well. And thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your prior service on the Finance Committee. Um, let's go to Jim. Okay, uh, first of all, it's interesting that all three of us have served on the Finance Committee. And I believe we all have served it very well in the Finance Committee. But being on the Finance Committee, it has served us very well. I do somewhat disagree with your statement. Um, the Finance Committee is a very important part of the entire town government. Not just town meeting, but the entire town government. It is the most recognized and respected committee in the town, both by its citizens, employees, and elected officials. The Finance Committee 
main duty is to advise town meeting on financial matters, i.e. the budget and some other things. The finance committee makes recommendations to town meeting. The finance committee is very important to the entire town because it actually is to check and balance on the financial matters. Um, but you also must remember the finance committee does make recommendations to the town meeting and the town meeting is ultimately responsible for accepting those recommendations whether up or down. Um, tiny, town meeting does make the financial decisions finally at the town meeting for the budget. Thank you. Thank you again for your prior service on FinCom and for that great answer. John, over to, over to you. Let's talk a little bit about finance committee. All right, so the finance committee, I, it was my first exposure to uh, municipal government and uh, I thought it was really cool. Uh, where I, what I took away from that was, first of all, we had a full complement of people who never had a problem having a quorum. So I, I must have been there at a different time. Um, what impressed me was the people on that committee were really smart and they were really dedicated to the town. I said, wow, that, you know, I've been here for like 55 years or 50 years, whatever it was at that point in time. And who knew that you had these busy people taking 10, 20 hours out of the week in February, March, and April to do, to do this analysis, thoughtful analysis of you know interviewing town employees. Let's do, let's look at zero-based budgeting. How did you get to this number? Let's explain it. And and I I, I thought that was refreshing. And I and I came away from that experience. I said, the town does a good job managing their finances. They're, they're, as a taxpayer, I felt good. It, it was, it was, I don't know. It was, I don't know if it was refreshing, restorative, and government because sometimes maybe we're cynical. And I, and I, so um, I, I think they have a critical role. And I think the the area that I, I was, you know, I did, would improve, or it, maybe it's improved. So it's not fair to say it doesn't exist today. There wasn't a lot of interaction. There might have been from the chairman of the finance committee, but between really uh, the town manager at that that time, who was a very very good town manager. There's, there's no pox in his house. I just thought it would be maybe fun and more interesting to have a little bit more conversation about it. But but by and large, I I mean, the, you know, to Jim's point, they 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 they're, they're boss. It's it's they're high value, and we should um, leverage their skills as much as we can. To, to keep this, the town on uh, solid financial footing. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, in, in, in the finance committee, in, in my remarks, what I'm, I was trying to convey is that they do play an important role. It takes an incredible commitment to be part of finance committee. Um, I would imagine it's sometimes a little disheartening when town meeting may not agree with your recommendations, uh, but they're there to play an important role Everyone would love to be able to say yes to every project right. if we could, right? But that's the role that finance committee plays, and they have to be the bad guys sometimes. They have to be the ones to say, well, we might not be able to afford it. Ultimately, it's up to town meeting. But it's an interesting part of our town government. Uh, and again, thank you for your service there. Uh, last year, finance committee noted, again, that town headcount is a major driver of costs, especially when it comes to retiree health care and pension obligations. Our town has an OPEB liability of 125 million roughly right now. Uh, and from what we've seen, it's estimated to grow to 344 million by 2050. How do we address this growing liability and what's the role of the select board in, in, in trying to address that? Uh, Jim, let's start with you. Uh, OPEC is a major long-term liability to Winchester, not well, I think not just Winchester, but the entire state, the other 359, 358 communities are dealing with the OPEC issue just like we are. Um, there is no official plan right now, substantial plan to fund OPEC. We are putting a minimal amount away into an account. I believe last year it was about $350, which is not making any real progress. We are paying the current OPED liabilities through the operating budget. Um, but there is no plan. Um, the general thought is that once the para number, which is the retirement numbers, near 100% or as near current revenue to face the pace of um, current expenses, that that money would be rolled over and paid for the para. The para numbers would be rolled over to pay for the OPEC numbers. Um, 
it very similar when we first started with the para. Um, the retirement was not funded. We have to fund the money for retirement. We've been doing that for 30 plus years. Yeah, maybe 30 plus years. We're pretty close to being close to 100. You're never going to hit 100 because you've got the constant number. We're getting pretty close. I believe the expectation is around 27, 28. It's a moving number mm -hmm. because town meeting, along with staff and everything, can move the number out. So once the para number is paid off, we will address a major liability in the OPEC number. Um, there are other ways of addressing the OPEC number. Uh, the first of all is obviously to raise taxes, and the other one is to cut services. Uh, I am in favor of not doing any of them right now. Unfortunately, what we're doing now satisfies a minimum requirement and keeps the subject in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Right on, right on time there. Uh, John, let's, let's move over to you uh, and then talk about this, um, this liability. And, and, and Jim, you make a really good point. It's not just Winchester. The 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts are all facing this liability, some to greater degrees than others. John, what do you have to say about this? Um, so, so Jim hit, hit on a lot of the high points. I mean, we're, we're about 3.8 percent. Uh, we're, we've got covered of that liability. The average in Massachusetts is 5.9 percent. Greater inner the greater Winchester area, we're pretty close to our peers. Um, our consultant says that 20% uh, of the town's bond rating is based on our OPEB liability. So we have to manage it at least as well as our peers. And, and as Jim points out, there's no silver bullet. I, I, I think that once we pay the, the pension liability down to the degree that we, we want to, then we're going to allocate those funds to this and, and knock this down. But this is, I th ultimately think it's going to be much more of a global, commonwealth-wide issue to be solved, and we just need to keep pace with it. I'm not, I, th I don't think that answers, the mm. answer's revealed itself yet, or anybody mm. has found the, the, uh, the, the magic. Yeah, and it's answer. not like we have to solve it tomorrow, That's right. right? It is a long-term problem, but it's something that does certainly deserve attention. That yes, I, I think it's a priority. Is that our number one priority? It, it, it's not. It's not that it's. We're not. Not that we're not committed to keeping our word to our current employees and retirees. It's just we have a number of other things that we must accomplish at the same time. Thank you. Well, Thank you, John. All right, Vince. Let's turn it over to you now. Well, this is certainly, as the other two gentlemen have indicated, uh, a long-term problem. Uh, but there's a lot of different pieces that have been touched on this question. While headcount is important, it is not necessarily an artificial god that should be worshipped, policed, and held to be something to be feared. An example is, in significant part due to my advocacy, the town budget added two positions to the fire department at the time I was on the finance committee. The next year, the fire chief came in and thanked us for that action and noted that it saved the town $250,000. This was through reduction in overtime, greater flexibility in staff assignments and other factors. So contrary to some ideas in this particular case, adding to headcount actually saved taxpayer money and increased the safety of the town. And there are other considerations, for instance, sufficient levels of staffing in the fire department actually have a modest impact in saving business owners on insurance as other uh, related economic issues. Regarding health care and pension issues, these are incredibly complex and dealing with them is very influential in the annual budget process depending on the year and various other factors. Healthcare liabilities and payments always have to be a first and a leading priority. Pension funds have to be and are analyzed yearly. Depending upon various other factors, these pension matters could be dealt with in differing ways. Ultimately, distinct engagement with employee unions and their collective bargaining approaches have to be part of the ongoing mix of dealing with these issues or we're never going to get to a position where we can solve it at all. The only municipality in the area that has dealt with it definitively to my knowledge is the town of Wellesley that actually did a debt override to fully fund their pension liability and effectively dispose of the issue. 
but I doubt such a move would be realistic in Winchester. Over the long term, Winchester has to determine some modest increases in density in the downtown areas and along North Main Street, hopefully utilizing mixed-use development, including an improved range of retail businesses to generate additional important and significant revenue as part of an entire picture. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to transition a little bit now. We've seen a lot of activity around town, uh, and it seems like it, a more aggressive pursuit of affordable housing uh, with the Waterfield lot in the Swanton Street projects. Um, these efforts have gotten a lot of attention from residents. And as you know, there was a referendum held last year in town that rejected the plan approved by town meeting with Civico down for the Waterfield lot. Despite the recommendations of a task force that was created after that to seek improvements to the current plan, the select board continued to negotiate with the same developer. They have, uh, we found out recently, received new concessions from the developer in the form of more parking and more revenue back to the town. And that's great. But it still seems like we may be leaving some money on the table or other benefits on the table by not reopening the bid. What do you think about these projects maybe maybe a minute on Waterfield and then a minute on Swan Street. Uh, and how would you approach affordable housing as a member of the select board? Vince, let's start right here with you. Well, this is, uh, of course, uh, I think we we don't have a three, third rail uh, <laughs> tee uh, here in town, but it's kind of a third rail of uh, the issue here. But here you are, and here we are. Um, I question whether public policy should be built on an edifice of 73 votes margin which was the differential between the no and the yes positions in the 2021 referendum on the Waterfield project. Beyond that observation, I think that there is a reasonable frustration about housing projects taking, as a local accent might say, forever. <laughs> if justice delayed is justice denied, then housing development delayed is also housing justice denied. While there is a need for reasonable deals, sometimes projects have to be designed, approved, built, completed, and integrated into the marketplace of business, residences, neighborhoods, and communities. That being said, the 40 or so units a year that Winchester can and should produce of affordable housing must be a goal that is kept not endlessly delayed. Town government must do its part. But the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which has larger resources, must do its part. And every once in a while, when the federal government engages, we should be ready to partner with them as well. We're in the Congressional District of the Assistant Speaker of the House of Representatives federally. Uh, that should be utilized a little more strongly. The entire burden cannot fall only on municipalities, and we must take a lead in organizing a regional affordable housing coalition to push the Commonwealth to be a proactive organization in creating housing across Massachusetts, not just endlessly stacked in places like Boston and Cambridge, and largely unaffordable to middle class and poor people. That is why I've taken a lead in filing legislation at the state level for community housing packages, which would push the Commonwealth in the direction of directly incentivizing and participating in large-scale housing development across the Commonwealth, the possible creation of a high-speed rail network with significant federal funds, the East-West Rail Link and the North-South Rail Link could help spread increasing housing creation at significantly lower cost in various lesser developed and or underutilized areas of the Commonwealth. And remember, the lower cost land is an important part of the transaction for building affordable housing. And we have to actually push the Commonwealth to take its share as opposed to just put more requirements on local communities. We should answer those requirements, but we have to ask the Commonwealth to do its job. Thank you, Vince. Great answer. And, and uh, just like the previous topic we were talking about, this is not just a Winchester issue. This is being felt in community after community in the greater Boston area and beyond. So we, w there's thousands of units that have not been produced in eastern Massachusetts, not just the 40 we didn't do last mm -hmm. year, uh, tens of thousands, and that's not going to be done just by individual communities being run over by the Commonwealth uh, that doesn't actually have a solution except more pressure. So it sounds like we need more partnership with the, with the state. And the we have to take the lead to tell the state what it needs to do through our legislative delegation. And we've just added, I guess, in the next term, uh, Precinct 6 of the Lexington District. So we will have another uh, House of Representatives member, Sicolo, perhaps. Uh, perhaps we just gained another member of our legislative delegation to push on those issues. All right, great. Thanks for that answer. Jim, what do yeah. you have to say about this? Um, affordable housing is a very complicated 
long-term solution that this community has been trying to deal with for years. I support well-planned affordable housing, whether it's here, there, or anywhere. Uh, right now, we have two locations that are identified by the select board and town meeting as very strong sites for affordable housing. Uh, the first one is obviously Swanton Water Street, uh, Swanton uh, Washington Street, which is right next door. Um, the select board is in the process, I believe, of developing an RFP to do a friendly 40B or a friendly LIP, which would address 40 units, maybe 50 um, of our goal. Uh, I think we have to go forward to it. Uh, the process has already started with the town meeting voting of taking the property. Uh, the town owns the property. It's time to move forward. To, to, to develop a comprehensive plan first of what the neighbors want, what the entire town wants, this 40B next door will have to address the concerns of the neighbors and the town and the housing requirements which just doesn't mean a one bedroom, two bedrooms, but now they're up to three bedrooms. We have to address the impact on our municipal services and our school system, which we will very successfully do. Um, it may take some time, but we are gonna do it. Uh, this project will go forward. There will be much more debate. There'll do be some analysis on traffic, impact of foot traffic, what do you really want there, the effect of condominiums versus housing, uh, versus housing for rental. I support rental property uh, because 100% of the rental number goes towards the housing number. We have a demand of approximately 800 new houses plus whatever the permits times 10%. Um, so I support rental. Uh, I realize that this project, the town is going to lose money on it millions possibly of dollars um, you know but we've got to do what is best and what is by law for the people in this town that deserve affordable housing um, for Waterfield Road that's a very complicated situation um, for 25 years 30 years they're always talking about the Waterfield lot. First, it was going to be a parking lot. Then that wasn't going to work. Uh, it was going to cater too much to the MBTA. A state senator wanted to put a parking lot here. The town fathers many years ago decided not to. Um, and in most cases, when you don't do something, it just lays idle for years. Uh, there is a movement down on the Waterfield lot to develop it. It does meet the town downtown requirements. It does address housing downtown. It does an awful lot of things. Um, it has been a long time consensus building to get this project underway. Um, there's some parts of it I don't like, and there's some parts I do like, just like any project. Um, I have realized in town government, we're never gonna get 100%. We have to work collectively and we'll get a good common goal that will benefit the town long term. I think we gotta work on that good common goal. I don't think it's quite there. Um, there is talk about whether you accept Servico, whether you put the bid out um, to, other to other contractors or, and see what they come up with. Uh, as a selectman, I pledge to do my due diligence on this project. Uh, but it's not going to take, it's not going to be a five minute deal. I mean, it, it's going to take an awful lot of time, an awful lot of understanding, and an awful lot of negotiation. When you get a town vote on a referendum question, and it is 50 50, basically, mm -hmm. I mean, the no's mm -hmm. did win, uh, it's got to tell an elected official something. There's a problem, and we have to work collaboratively to get the problem moving again all right thank you jim we're gonna oh, try we're okay. gonna yeah, yeah right, we're gonna go send on. it over to john here john <laughs> and then we'll uh we're gonna wrap things up we're uh, almost at our time limit already boy time has flown <laughs> we <can> go long <laughs> all right john. so this is so i think the question was what do you think about these projects and how would you approach how sure yes okay, thank so you for how our approach affordable housing is 
we take volumes and we only have 10 or 15 minutes left. Relative to these two projects, I'm, I'm not sure if they're the right projects or not the right projects. I do believe we should fulfill our obligation to affordable housing. Um, I think it, I think a lot of the conversations we have and, and, it, um, here locally and at the federal and state level is, is trust, trust in the process. So is that process, does everybody understand why we're doing it? Did, did we ex explain what it is and then did we follow it? And then did we t let people know what the results are? And I think when you do that, there's, there's, there may not be a need for a referendum because you, we agreed as a community going in what we were after. Um, so I, I agree with Jim that it's, it's not a, a quick process, but sometimes um, people who are viewing think because you're gonna be deliberative, you're, that's, that's, um, you're, you're, you're not desiring to accomplish it. It just means you wanna be thorough and do it right because you only got one chance to do it right. So that, that would be my thoughts on that. All right, fair enough. Let's go, well, let's uh, try to get a one minute answer in on this and then I'll let you make, well, actually, yeah, let's try to do this. Um, I wanna just talk a little bit about uh, the state of our politics. Unfortunately, it seems that we've sort of lost the ability to disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, the civility and decorum of national pol politics seems to be at an all time low and this trend is spreading to state houses and municipal governments across the country seems like compromise, which is what I grew up thinking politics was all about, has become a dirty word, and that it shows weakness rather than strength. We could go on all night about the reasons why we find ourselves in this state, but let's rather really hear some answers on how do we get out of it and how do we bring that civility and decorum back. Let's go right over to you, John. Sure. Um, well, I, 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 it's part of its perception. Like, it, it, if you perceive that the person you're negotiating with is trying to stick it to you, then that's probably not going to work out really well. So you have, you want to, I mean, my approach is, is to, um, to be, to re reach a consensus, but in order to do that, I have to question, I have to understand, you know, what, what, what do you want out of this? Why do you want out of that? And, and how can we do that? But it, it, it's, um, I, I, you know, Jim and Vince all talked about it, is, is, is 80% of us in the middle. And sometimes the loudest voices are on the margins. Doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to them, but should that drive the conversation? And I know what my answer is, and it's no. I'm here to represent the 80% in the middle. All right. All right, thank you, John. Jim. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, civility and decorum in our civic engagement. Yeah. Um it, it, it's an interesting question. My, my quick answer to that is the town of Winchester has always worked collectively with a very large volunteer base. Everybody comes to the table primarily with one concern, and that is they're consistently caring about our community. And they want to do something to make it a better place to live. So you've got to take that in mind. Now, people view things on opposite ends of the table. The true way to getting a consensus is by working with people. You know, listen to people I don't want to listen to, and listen to people I do want to listen to. And then I would have to take some time. I would also, and I have also learned, how valuable um, support staff is, whether it's a consultant, or something else. And what the select board should try to do is to work collaboratively to get to the common goal. Um, you know, the art, of the, the art of negotiation is to have a great deal where both sides feel they didn't completely lose. Hey, everybody wants to win. I love winning. But you know, sometimes I don't. And I would rather say I didn't completely win than say I didn't completely lose. So if I can pull everybody together, get the consensus, justify what each side says, work to a common goal, use staff, use consultant, use people who are knowledgeable, I think we come up with a pretty decent product. And that's what I have done in the past 
and that's what I want to do in the future. All right. We if have I two, can get people's vote. Two glass half full guys over here, and the third right here. Let's see what Vince has to say. Well, the uh, context of what we're dealing with is, of course, complex. We've touched on that in many different ways. Uh, to do the job, we have to deal with the detail. We have to have a sustained, comprehensive outlook and plan. And I think it means that we have to uh, tighten up our administration in many different ways. Uh, we need to have a full, complete search for a permanent town manager who will keep a commitment for five years. We shouldn't be have a revolving door for our town administrator. We believe we are first-class town. We should have a first-class manager, a first-class process, and part of that is the education of staff as to what the laws are, what the procedures are, and to look at public safety and other issues as well. And one of the things that has been only lightly touched on here is the need for development, carefully development, in the downtown and North Main Street area. Uh, we do have buildings that are four and five stories that go back many years that are beautiful buildings. Uh, we shouldn't be just content with one or two story buildings. Uh, if you do a back of the envelope, I believe the density of Winchester is about 20% that of Cambridge. We are in no fear of having too much overdevelopment. And if you look at the traffic that needs to be enforced and the traffic enforcement rules going through town, if 1% of those people going to the uh, office parks in Woburn and other places stopped in the town with some newer and additional retail and stores, then we would get some millions of dollars of additional revenue. We have to commit to bringing that new revenue in. We need to use some of that revenue to also have an improved school system that includes a complete preschool program, not forcing parents and students to have to have a lottery to see if they'll actually go in preschool to one of the best schools we think in the area. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vince. So we the vision, by the way. Yes, thank you. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. We're nearing the end of the program here, so um, I don't know if we have time to go over, but I think we're just we're gonna we're gonna start saying our thank yous and good night. So um, I want to thank Jim Johnson. I want to thank Vincent Dixon and John Fallon for their time here tonight. Again, I want to thank Future Winchester for putting this forum together. I'd like to thank the people that helped put it together the, the draft agenda and the questions that we have here in front of us. And of course, we want to thank the great team here at WinCam for providing us some media attention and giving us a chance to get this discussion out for the residents of Winchester to watch, listen, and evaluate you all as candidates. Finally, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, voting day is March 19th, that's a Saturday. All the voting takes place between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. at the Winchester High School. Absentee ballots are now available through the town clerk's office. So please exercise that, uh, that responsibility that we all have. Get out and vote on Saturday, March 19th. Again, thank you, gentlemen, for being here tonight. Thank you. And this will conclude tonight's program. Jim Coya, Steve. Jim Coya. Thank you. <laughs>